eggs increase our chances of diabetes? So it's interesting that there are specific studies that are quoted saying the opposite, that eggs can protect from diabetes. And then there, uh, probably the most widely quoted article, uh, um, which was actually quoted in the 2015 Dietary Guidelines, uh, the initial report, um, where it says that it adding, uh, having eggs, if you compare two groups of people, people who have at least one egg per day versus those who have zero to one per week, okay? Um, that if you compare those two groups, you don't see any short-term cardiovascular effects. But, you know, I really do want my patients to live more than three or five years, so I kind of would be interested more in the long-term effects. Uh, and if you look at that, uh, that meta-analysis of large studies that had zero to one versus at least seven a week, okay, what you saw was a 49% increase in the development of diabetes, and you saw a 69% uh, increase in heart attack or cardiovascular disease in the people who, developed, who had diabetes. So that would say, yes, eggs are associated with the development of diabetes, and if you get it, you're, or if you have it already, you should avoid it because it's going to increase your heart disease. Now, the problem with that and the reason that you can get such wide variation uh, in uh, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, mortality, um, and bet between eggs or not eggs, uh, or, or, and even the, the serum cholesterol. Does the cholesterol go up when you eat eggs? The reason that you can get a variety of answers is it totally depends on how the study is done. So. If you take a, the average American eating two eggs and three strips of bacon for breakfast, and you take them and you say, you know, I'm going to get rid of the eggs. You're going to get rid of the eggs and you're going to replace it with something. You if you replace it with pancakes and butter, you're probably actually going to worsen the outcome because it turns out that refined flour in every study, the refined flour actually is worse than eating animal products, okay? Sugar, worse than eating animal products. So you'd have to know exactly what people are doing when they, when they cut those eggs, okay? So you'd actually have to, it's hard to do it observationally. You have to do it prospectively and say, here, you're gonna, you've been eating this and now you're going to eat this minus blank, whatever that is, okay? Um, but if you remove the bacon, will they substitute, um, you know, sausage? Well, they're both processed meat. You, know, you could remove the bacon and, and then come to the conclusion that removing bacon made no difference in the cardiovascular disease. Well, it's because they substituted with something that was equally bad. Uh, and this, you could say the same thing about the eggs. That is, when you reduce the eggs, are you just going to eat more bacon? And, uh, and now you've, you've added not just cholesterol, but a larger amount of saturated fat. Um, and so, you know, making the argument that the components that go into bacon are terrible, but the components that go into eggs look actually really good, a lot of protein, a lot of uh, 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 omega-3s and things that should, in theory, be good for you. Well, you know, you'd have to get that data from randomized trials. And if you're concerned about the consumption of animal protein and IGF-1 causing diabetes and cancer, um, you know, you'd, have to be, you'd have to be really circumspect ab about using eggs until you had really long-term prospective randomized trials. Not the short-term, they have plenty of those. And they'll say, oh, the cholesterol doesn't go, doesn't go down or doesn't go up. Well, that has to do with absorption of cholesterol. And you can saturate your absor the uh, cholesterol absorption uh, with a fair amount of cholesterol. And so if you go from m modest amounts of cholesterol to large, you will see an increase in serum cholesterol, but not very much. If you go to none to large, you'll see a dramatic increase. And same in, in reverse. If you cut down on your cholesterol consumption, 
you may not see a change in your cholesterol. If you eliminate cholesterol consumption, you see a big decrease. And you know, 30 to 50% decrease in your LDL cholesterol. And so you know, the, the articles that say uh, diet doesn't matter, they're probably you know, taking those two eggs with, you know, that would be about 230 milligrams of cholesterol per egg yolk. You'd do two of them, that's 660, or I'm oh, sorry, 460 uh, milligrams of cholesterol. And then uh, replacing that with, uh, well, more bacon because I gotta eat something. And when you do that, you don't see a change in cholesterol because the bacon has both cholesterol and saturated fat. So uh, we need to be very careful in how the research is done and then how it's interpreted. And the interpretation has a lot to do with how it's done. What impact does a whole food plant-based diet have on blood pressure? So hypertension really is a major focus for us because of the expenditures in the United States and now around the world on this disease and its consequences, okay? And if you add up not just the kidney failure and dialysis and stroke, but just hospitalization for heart failure and outpatient visits and medications, for high blood pressure, it is such a, an economic burden uh, for our Medicare system because it happens more and more as people get older. Um, and if, if you look carefully at what we're spending, if we could fix one thing that would fix the healthcare budget, it would be hypertension. So what is the effect of whole food plant-based diet on it? We've had large prospective randomized trials that have looked at this. And if you believe the Intermap studies, uh, Jeremiah Stamler at Northwestern uh, led a lot of that. It's actually a specific amino acid in um, uh, uh, grains, whole grains, uh, and that amino acid is glutamic acid. If you're eating a lot of those whole grains, you will see a drop in blood pressure. And the drop in blood pressure is very much related to the amount of glut glutamic acid in the diet. So we should all be eating more vegetables. We should all be eating specifically grains uh, to keep the blood pressure low. And so um, now, that's a good mechanism of how it can improve things. The other side of it is people doing a whole food plant-based diet have the benefit of not having the negatives of eating animal products, the saturated fat, uh, the cholesterol, the salt that's in the bacon and the like. And so, um, so it's sort of a double-edged sword. It's improving things on the one side and it's getting rid of things that are very damaging on the other. What's happening to our healthcare system and what will happen if nothing changes? How will we afford to pay for everyone's medical care? So healthcare financing is a major issue uh, for me. Um, I talk about it incessantly being a Medicare advisor on the ambulatory payment classification, HOPS, Hospital Outpatient Prospective Payment System uh, Committee, uh, for four years. I learned a lot about them, and I learned a lot about our system, uh, and I have really strong feelings that, about you know, how we should go about fixing it. Um, there are plenty of countries who don't expend as much money as we do in the United States on healthcare and have better outcomes. If you look at the graphs of where we fall, um, the quality of the care, uh, or the, I'm sorry, not the quality of the care, the quality of the outcomes of the care, okay, uh, versus the expenditure, we're way out of line with everyone else in the world. So I wanna make that distinction. Quality of the care is the best. Why do those people who, have, who look better on the graph, why do they come to the United States for care? Because they know that the care is good. So why are our outcomes not so good? It's the people, okay? And it's the lifestyle of the people. And, you know, we are fighting an uphill battle where prevention is thought of after the fact, if at all. So you look at the number of people who, after a heart attack, where Medicare will pay for cardiac rehabilitation, who are actually referred, apparently it's less than 50% uh, of the eligible people. And so we're not thinking about it for peripheral artery disease, we're not thinking about it for heart failure, um, you know, bypass surgery, stenting. We should be thinking about cardiac rehab for everyone as secondary prevention. But how about primary prevention? Why not say, you know, I, I actually, I, I 
coined the phrase, uh, instead of doing cardiac rehabilitation, why don't we do cardiac prehabilitation, <laughs> okay? Let's do it before they have an event. Um, you can talk about exercise a lot, um, but it's probably, the big experts will estimate it at you know, 80, 20, or four to one. That is, the nutrition is four times more important than the exercise. Well, if that's the case, we have laws in the state of Illinois about seatbelt wearing. Why don't we have laws about, you know, unhealthy foods? Now, you could say that, uh, and I, I am a good friend uh, of Cass Sunstein, who's one of the authors of Nudge, that whole idea that, you know, the society does have the right and the responsibility to put things in place like 55, like seatbelt laws or, you know, driving 55 miles an hour in expressways in cities and the like, that we do things for the greater good of society even though they interject their way into our personal freedom. Well, the question is how far do you go with that? And I think how far you have to go with it is whether or not the system's imploding. And when we were having too much too many deaths from drunk driving, we make drunk driving laws. And, you know, seat belts have really dramatically decreased motor vehicle accident deaths. Well, how about changing the laws for healthier nutrition? Put them in schools, put them in hospitals, uh, put them in all public places, incentivize uh, the, the price breaks for eating healthy foods and increase the price of unhealthy foods. If we do all of that, we will save the Medicare system. The media often reports that alcohol in moderation is part of a healthy diet. What do you think about alcohol's impact on our health? I was really relieved at the Euro European Society of Cardiology last August when a large analysis said that alcohol doesn't matter, it doesn't help. You know, if you, the, that whole concept of a J-shaped curve that myself as a non-drinker had a higher cardiovascular death rate than the people who drink a modest amount. Um, so I was relieved <laughs> because I try to do everything that I can uh, to reduce cardiovascular mortality. Um, and I just don't do alcohol well. I know there are plenty of people who can, but I'm just not one of them. And so um, it, the data has always been, that's sort of a, a, a real uh, phenomenon of, of research, you know, that if you ask the French, it's got to be red wine and it's got to be from Bordeaux, and if it's coming from another country, it doesn't count, you know. So is it the resveratrol, okay, in, in grapes that they have a, you know, different quantity? No one ever has figured that part out. Uh, the so-called French paradox, eating relatively high-fat food uh, and having a relatively low uh, cardiovascular mortality, uh, a lot of cigarette smoking in France, but they seem to be doing pretty well. Well, there's a, you could plug a lot of holes in that. You know, when I'm there, uh, I see a lot of cardiovascular disease. The hospitals are very active. Um, the people are more active. Um, and so there are a lot of elements of lifestyle that, that bring the alcohol portion into question. It may actually help some groups, um, but if a person is living a healthy lifestyle, it's probably not the most important thing or one of the biggest things that one can or should do. Uh, nothing wrong with alcohol in small amounts for the, for the heart. There are people who develop alcoholic cardiomyopathy with large amounts. They probably should stay away from it completely.